Hi everybody and welcome back to part two of our Sansui TUX1 uh, tuner series here. And uh, in part one, just to kind of catch you up, we uh, did an overview of the whole unit and kind of showed some of the features of it. And we then we did the full alignment of the FM and uh, FM stereo section of this tuner. And uh, if you haven't already seen that video, you might want to go back and watch that because uh, a lot of good stuff on there and a lot of things I'm going to talk about are were already covered in the first video. So what this is is a continuation. And we're going to focus on this video on the AM section of this receiver. And uh, it is really unique. And the more I study it, the more I learn about it, uh, the more fascinated I am by this tuner. Um, several of you have given me some fantastic comments um, uh, brought a few things to my attention that I was unaware of because uh, I really haven't really up until uh, recently I didn't sit down and go through the entire theory of operation how things work uh, the FM section was really straightforward and uh, it was extremely well built but it was you know pretty pretty common technology just executed very very well not the case with this AM it is uh, f at least for me personally it's pretty unique to these to uh, at least a AM FM tuner that you would use for broadcast you know AM broadcast and so forth um, it's m more similar I mean some of the technology they're using uh, is more similar to a uh, ham radio type receiver or, or a communications receiver in that it uh, uses some things that you don't normally see in a regular AM tuner. A lot of stereos out there, uh, I wouldn't quite say in the high-end ones that the AM section is an afterthought, but really the big focus was on, you know, distor low distortion, really good FM, really good multiplex, really good stereo separation, all those things. And the AM, they, you know, they may put uh, extra sta RF stages to make it a little more sensitive and things, but really, it, at the core, it was just an AM tuner. This is not like that. Um, there's some really unique things, and I'll try to go over them with you. Uh, bear in mind that I am not an expert <laughs> on this circuit, so take what I say with kind of a grain of salt. It's as I'm understanding it, and you and I are learning together. Uh, one of the things you you may notice about my videos is I kind of post them the way that the way that I that they are. I don't try to edit too much out other than to shorten it for content. But really, um, if I'm wrong, I'll leave it on there and let you see that I'm wrong, and uh, we can work together to you know we can see what I do to find out to make it right or possibly. If you catch somewhere where I'm wrong, you can correct me, and you know we can all learn together. But I think it's good to 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 see the learning process. Um, the purpose I do these videos is to leave something behind so that um, I can share my experiences with others, so that down the road, any of you that want to get into working on these things or later on when a lot of the old timers are gone and uh, this becomes more of a curiosity or a museum type thing because the, this kind of technology has gone away there will at least be some documentation and there's quite a few people out there on YouTube and so forth that are doing this and I think it's wonderful and that's why I try to contribute a little bit to it too but anyhow enough of that let's uh, let's look at what this thing uh, really how it works and uh, go over a few things on it that makes it unique. So the first thing you'll notice is that there is a pretty large uh, schematic here <laughs> and this is only the AM section and uh, in the beginning it kinda looks pretty standard. Um, they're showing here how the FA7 and we talked about that. That's this board up here. You see it right there. Um, they're showing the schematic of the FA7 board and how it ties into the AM section. And once we get through that, okay, and again, this is to accommodate the special FA7 antenna. 
It's a patent pending antenna that was designed specifically for this unit and uh, unfortunately there's very little information available on it. Um, I've, ne I've never seen anything except that little image that I showed you on the first video so I know very little about it although it, it looks similar to just a regular directional antenna but it also has an AM section to it as well so it's multi-band and um, once again uh, this circuitry is made to perfectly match that antenna to this and in the on the FM anyways as you wrote you can rotate that antenna because it's highly directional for FM and that allows you uh, to pretty much reduce or even eliminate the multipath interference uh, that you so often get with FM so probably if we had that antenna this thing would be in order of magnitude even more sensitive and and even better performing so really this thing was designed to work with that antenna I don't think a whole lot of people purchased that antenna nor do I think it was really made super available so I don't think there were a whole lot of them out there but it would be really cool to see the design and try to recreate it because it doesn't look like anything but a basic uh, directional element antenna with you know, it only looked like it had maybe three elements on it or something not too complicated but it would be really cool because I know a lot of you antenna guys out there would would tear that one up you'd make you'd be able to make one of those and we could try it but anyways from there it just goes into your standard RF amplifier and it's a dual gate MOSFET once again uh, pretty pretty basic uh, you have your local oscillator and then and I'm kinda the reason I'm stuttering I'm looking around the camera as I'm doing this but right here this integrated circuit is actually your mixer circuit so instead of just using a standard transistor they're using a mixer and then I believe this is a filter and it's when you come out of here you got 455 kilohertz uh, intermediate frequency so this uh, I had one comment uh, since this was sold in Europe is the IF frequency different than it would be in America and the answer is no they this this was a standard receiver and no matter what part of the world that was shipped to other than changing the voltage uh, the design of this to my understanding is the same as far as IF and all that so it's a standard 10.7 megahertz IF for FM and 455 kilohertz for AM where the difference is is once we get beyond this part if you notice we go through a differential amplifier and then we start to split our signals off this right here is our AGC is where our AGC circuit comes in and if you notice there's this little device here it's actually an optocoupler and uh, that optocoupler actually is how the AGC controls uh, controls the gain of the circuit and, and I didn't really study very carefully how that works but very unique they must have needed some sort of isolation in order to do that to lower noise or whatever um, now it then goes through some phase shift and it goes down into these two demodulator chips they're the same chip there's IC02 and IC03 and these work in conjunction with one another to have your um, your IF detection and your phase detection and then that all gets fed back around in here and it creates a uh, phase lock loop to adjust your VCO your voltage controlled oscillator and then where it really gets unique is when you get to over to this section over here they're actually uh, dear, and again I'm referring back to video one if you noticed when we were tuning around on on the AM band uh, with this tuner I talked about uh, you know I kind of mentioned that uh, you heard those birdies you know you could actually hear when you're hitting the sidebands and when you pass through the center frequency and then you get to the other sideband you'd get those weird squeals almost like a TRF receiver well th th as it turns out the way that this thing the detector works on this is it's not a standard AM detector circuit um, it actually uses and let me uh, make sure I get my terms right here uh, 
it uses a uh, synchronized product detector, they call it. So the synchronized is that it, it uses PLL and a VCO, uh, and it uses these two chips. And the, the product detection is where they actually strip off, and they have like a little, di little diagram of it, but they basically strip off the upper sideband and the lower sideband of the AM signal. And then they use the product of the two to uh, to generate a, an accurate signal. So if you have if you have noise or interference at the upper or lower sideband of that AM broadcast, it can actually reject that by by looking at the product and the difference of your sidebands. And to go even beyond that. Um, if you wanted to uh, to even more cancel out the uh, you know the interference from above or below the station, that's what this beat canceller is for. And if you look at where it says beat canceller, right here, I don't know if you can read that, but there's upper and lower. And what we can do is we can either cancel the upper sideband or the lower sideband of that signal, and then this circuit over here will actually it will double the you'll either have two times upper or two times lower to create um, it's not it's not like a single sideband receiver but it will basically create the entire signal out of one sideband um, I hope I'm describing that properly or explaining it properly um, so once again the these are tricks that are done in ham radio a lot like a lot of the the receivers you know of that time could do that if you were looking at a communications monitor like for ham radio but very rarely did you see anything like that in a, just a tuner that you would buy for your stereo this is kind of extreme and they do that for two reasons number one they want to be able to extract the maximum frequency range of that station that it that they can but while they're doing that they also want to reject as much um, interference as possible whether that interference is from an adjacent channel whether that interference is is noise um, AM noise uh, whatever the case may be that's what they're trying to deal with and other than hearing that squeal as you're tuning around so remember I said in that video that might be the way it's supposed to work yes it is the way it's supposed to work that's kind of a uh, a byproduct of, of this circuit uh, you as you tune off station you, you'll hear that difference and that's that product detection is actually going to be off kilter because you're not centered on the channel so you hear that squealing and howling that's normal what you will notice is once it locks in on that station uh, the noise is a lot lower than on a standard um, AM radio or receiver with just a standard detector, you know, like a diode detector or whatever. So this is a really cool design and it should be superior when it comes to performance when you want to compare it to other tuners out there on the market, which is what made this thing so special and so expensive. Um, we are going to go through the alignment procedure and if you look at the alignment there's 11 steps to it, but really the first eight are the ones that were, you know, that are going to make the biggest difference. The other ones are pretty, you know, dial calibration and the sensitivity. That's pretty straightforward. But the first thing they have you do is you start out with adjusting your IF like you normally do. It then has an adjustment for your AGC. Then you adjust your meters. Then we have the VCO adjustment. We're going to do that then you have those phase shifts uh, that you use where that's that's that phase shift is very critical um, when it comes to generating your upper and lower sidebands for your product detector so those have to be accurate for this to work right um, then that beat canceling circuit when you want to bring it in to reduce noise this is the adjustment for that then you have your muting which is another thing that's kind of unique uh, to this radio is that a lot of the other receivers will have a muting circuit for the FM but they don't always have muting on the AM this one has AM muting as well um, and then you'll have your dial 
your dial accuracy calibration and the last but not least is sensitivity where you're going to go through and you're just going to peek out you know the the receiver to make it you know to adjust for maximum sensitivity which is the bar antenna and your front end and so your tuning caps and all that stuff at, at the beginning so it's pretty straightforward but uh again it's different than than a lot of other am tuners a lot of am tuners the tuner section if you notice i don't even always show it uh, on my videos because it's pretty straightforward you put a 455 if modulated signal you tweak up your if then you put you know a high high channel you know modulated carrier and then a low a low frequency modulated carrier you know for the bottom of the band top of the band set your dial accuracy peek everything out and boom you're done this is a little different so that gives you kind of a little overview of what we're going to do in this video once we get this thing uh, dialed in or at least verified that it already is dialed in if it is then we're going to put everything back together so if that sounds good that's going to be the rest of this video so stay tuned and i'm going to get things set up and get ready to start doing our alignment okay for our first uh alignment process we're going to do the if and as i've said many times you have to adapt your test equipment um, to the procedure because you don't always have the same test equipment that that they're recommending now they're showing a genoscope and a genoscope is a kind of a, it's an IF sweep generator and it only does a sweep frequency in the IF for, for AM and FM some there's also AM only genoscopes and FM only genoscopes and then there's higher end ones that will cover both bands but uh, Essentially, it works a little bit like a poor man's spectrum analyzer um, in that it, it you can sweep a certain frequency, it'll put some markers on there, and then you can use the built-in oscilloscope to uh, set your peak and center it and so forth. Uh, since I don't have that, what I'm going to do, um, and I think will probably even be a little more accurate, is we're going to use the spectrum analyzer for this. So. What I've done is we're connecting the input of our, or the tracking generator of our spectrum analyzer into this filter. We're, we're adjusting the IF filter is what we're doing here. So right here at TP03, we're going to inject our tracking generator signal. So that's basically a tracking generator is just going to be a sweep signal. And then we're going to measure the output with our spectrum analyzer at TP10, which is all the way, um, let's see where it was. It was all the way down in here, right around your AGC. Let me see if I can find it again. Right here, TP10. So if you look there, that's where we're going to check it. So right before it goes into this optocoupler. Um, and what we're going to try to do is we're just going to try to center the you know the uh, the bandwidth of that of that filter right on 455 kilohertz. Now I have it connected and just initially looking at it. Let's see if I can get this over here where you can see it. Um, you can see that it's not completely centered properly. I don't know if I can focus in on this there so what we need to do is see how that's kind of that's not a nice flat topped peak so we're not we're, we're kind of one side band is that of the you know of that filter is higher than the other so we're not centered on our four this center line here is four represents 455 kilohertz so we're going to adjust that filter now to see if we can straighten that out a little bit it's not bad but it's it's off a little bit so let's see here's the first one and that's not it let me get on this other one here there we go and you can see it just brings it right on there and if we uh, take our marker 
and you can see it's just kind of centered right over top of that peak. So that's what you want to do is you want it to be symmetrical. Um, and that's about all I can get there, right? Like that. Now, that does not look totally centered over the 455 kilohertz. So we're going to have to see if we can do something to adjust that a little bit. But uh, I don't know if there's any adjustment in there that I can, you know, I can do. At this one, there's two adjustments on transformer T02 and on that filter and one of them has no effect the other one flattens it out and I believe the other one is the one that will center it it doesn't seem to be having any effect and I can tell somebody looks like somebody has been in there because in order to get to this and I'll show you in order to get to this thing you have to remove the the FA7 board and uh, when I went to take this out one screw had the had the little washer under it you can see the little washer and the other one did not so I know somebody has had that board out um, and I could see the paint was scratched on those two pots so I think somebody was in there at some point and tried to adjust it but I'm not a hundred percent sure um, and where I'm adjusting is right here this transformer right here this is the transformer and this was the one that allowed us to center it or uh, to uh, flatten it you know make it make it uh, symmetrical but this one is I believe is the one that should allow us to center it and turning it has absolutely no effect so I'm wondering if maybe there's something going on with this filter that it's off by a little hair because um, it is off so right there so, and I'm not one of those people that likes to power tweak things. I, I make an adjustment, and if it doesn't move it, I put it right back, because you can really get things out of whack by doing that. But, yeah, that's making no, no change whatsoever. So, my question is, is there something wrong with this because again we're off peak a little bit um, that this flat top should be totally centered right over this 455 kilohertz and it's not according according to the instructions so and I'll show you what I mean by that so they want this thing peaked right on 455 kilohertz so and again this is this is a little different because you have these markers on you know on the marker generator with the genoscope we're we're doing a uh, you know a spectrum sweep so essentially by making that peak flat and then moving the center back and forth we're doing essentially the same thing we're just kind of looking at it from a little different perspective so uh, let me look into this a little more and see if this is something that I'm doing wrong or if there's actually a problem that we need to troubleshoot. All right, so I've centered the the peak of this filter and I'm just I'm I don't even have the receiver turned on. I actually just kind of went straight in through the filter itself. And it's supposed to be an adjustable bandpass filter and it is you can adjust the symmetry of it but you can't adjust the centering of it at all uh, and I think I'm not sure because I cannot find any data on this filter whatsoever the only thing they, they don't even list it in the parts list because it's part of a board and they only go down to board level on this but there is a, a designator on it of A1-51FF and uh, that's all they tell you but this instead of 455 kilohertz this filter seems to be centered on 452 kilohertz and uh, your 6 dB downs are eh, somewhere in the line of plus and minus uh, maybe 11 or 12 kilohertz on either side and again I'm not sure how that's going to affect the rest of the tuner because I can adjust the symmetry and I can show you that 
and there you see how I'm moving it and I can make it nice and symmetrical but what I cannot do is I cannot change the center frequency of the filter so the question is has this filter drifted um, or is it or is, has something failed in it that we can't adjust not sure but uh, we have it as good as we can get it right now at that center frequency we're going to move on and just kind of see what happens from here if we can get everything to come in maybe this is not a big deal and i'm making a mountain out of a molehill i don't know but we'll find out all right we're going to do a part here and i thought you'd be interested in seeing this um, of the alignment where we're going to adjust the 90 degree phase difference um, for the phase shifter and uh, this this is something unique to this particular type of tuner and you have to have the the uh, these two signals 90 degrees out of phase and the way they have you do it is using a phase meter now I don't have one of those because it's something I don't use very often and I don't need but normally what what would happen is you would use this phase meter, you would feed two signals in, two sine waves, it would compare the two, and if they're, you know, whatever you set it to, like 90 degrees, 180 degrees out of phase, whatever, you set that to be your center line, and then when, when they're the correct phasing, the needle would be in the middle. Um, at least the ones I've seen have worked like that. Uh, we're going to do it a little different once again. And what I've done is I'm using my oscilloscope to measure the phase difference. Now you have to have a scope that can really trigger very accurately to get this to work. Um, but it will work if you do it. Um, we're on TP13 and TP14 and uh, we're injecting <coughs> a signal into TP03. So I'll show you all that here in a second. So we have our test equipment set up to the test, test points. And let me move you over to the scope now. And if you look at the oscilloscope, there we go. It's kind of jumpy, but if you can get the thing to trigger properly, I have it so that one, one peak of channel one is right on this center line. 90 degrees out of phase will be the zero crossing of your sine wave so if you see right here there's your zero crossing so you can see these are both 90 degrees out of phase now this everything is very jumpy right here first of the first problem you have with this receiver is that it's old and a lot of the alignments are done in here not using typical like you'd see in a normal tuner you know uh, slugs, slug tuning, you know, with a RF transformer or IF transformer, but you actually have potentiometers. <clears throat> so if you look here, you have these pots, and obviously the teeniest little bit of noise on these pots will cause that to happen. So I've had to go through and kind of work some of these back and forth as I'm going through and aligning this thing to get this all to fall into place. So uh, we have it set up, and it was really pretty close, but uh, I have it right on now, so it's 90 degrees. Again, you have to adapt to the test equipment you have. Um, the other thing is, if you notice on these instructions, <clears throat> Sansui doesn't always be very specific as to what they want. If you look at these signals that they talk about, They'll tell you the output level and the modulation level, but they don't tell you whether they want it to be an IF signal at 455 kilohertz or if they want an RF carrier at, you know, at, uh, you know, 1 megahertz or 600 kilohertz or whatever. And so you kind of have to figure that out as you go along. Same thing here when they're asking for 160 millivolts, they don't tell you if it's AC or DC. Um, you, again, you have to figure it out. This this is actually an AC measurement, and uh, you have to use a sensitive VTVM or or a good uh, digital uh, digital meter that you know that's true RMS. 
<clears throat> if it's not, it'll throw this alignment off. So you have to have the right test equipment. So uh, as you can see, this is a little bit uh, challenging just because of the, the limited information. And there are some notes, and if you really read the instructions and you study the schematics, you can figure out what they're talking about. But really, this is the very short abbreviated version of a alignment instruction. They are assuming that you know all of this stuff before you attempt to do it. So not the easiest thing if, for that. The alignment itself is relatively, like I said, straightforward. So <clears throat> we have this lined up. Now we're going to do the audio phase shifter adjust. And that's going to be done on the oscilloscope as well. And we're going to have to do a Lissajou pattern. Uh, my <clears throat> these digital scopes don't do really well with Lissajou patterns. Uh, they will do them, but they don't do them very clearly. So we're going to switch back over to our, uh, our old analog scope. Old reliable, <laughs> the 2465, and uh, we'll get it all set up. Okay, video clip take two. Um, I'll tell you, this, this record button is really tiny on this camera. This is a really pretty nice camera, but the record button is so flaky on this thing. If you just don't watch what you're doing, it'll record and turn back off immediately as soon as you touch it. And that's what happened to me, and I didn't realize that. So we're going to do take two on this. Um, this next adjustment is the audio phase shifting adjustment. And it involves using an oscilloscope in XY mode. And as I said earlier, XY mode on these digital scopes is not very good. Um, it will work, but you get a lot of noise, and it's not not really very clear so we're back to our Tektronix 2465 um, this involves injecting a 1 kilohertz signal so let me go back to 1 kilohertz because I've already done the adjustment and it's right on <clears throat> and then connecting your scope right here and here so we're injecting our signal at two points it's the same signal you just inject it at two points and then we're going to go and measure it on our scope up here. And you can see I have this set. And it should display a circle if the phasing is correct. And there is a there are two pots and there are two set points. There's a 1 kilohertz and a 9 kilohertz set point for the audio that you want the phase to be proper. And it, this whole thing, the, the phase lock loop and everything, is critical to these phasing adjustments being right on. So if everything's in phase, you will get a perfect circle here. Now, being that this camera is a little bit at an angle, it looks a little bit distorted to you. But uh, looking straight on to the scope, it's, perfect. it's a perfect symmetrical circle right now. Um, and if we adjust the pot, I'll just show you what it looks like. You can see how it will distort. And the idea is to set this as round as possible. So you want it to be perfectly round. And then you move to 9 kilohertz. And you can see the noise goes down a little bit as you're looking at a higher frequency. And it's it was perfect. I didn't have to adjust it. The 1 kilohertz did need adjusted when I first ran through this, but the 9 was right on. So now that our audio phase shifting is, uh, is adjusted, um, the last part of this calibration of the AM section is going to involve mostly the dial, dial indicate, you know, dial centering, whatever you want to call it, making sure that the dial is accurate dial accuracy, I guess you'd say, and the sensitivity adjust, which is where you peak your RF section uh, to make sure everything's on center and uh, for sensitivity. And I'll do that off camera because that's relatively straightforward. Uh, I did find that while I was in here, there was a 13 and a half volt power supply that was out to lunch pretty bad. Uh, it was about a volt and a half off, more than a volt and a half off. So I adjusted that, came right in. And that very substantially, <laughs> as you could imagine, uh, helped with the alignment. Uh, one other note, 
if we go back down here the first adjustment that we did as we were as you'll see and I did these clips out of order because I kind of jumped around and when I edit this I'll try to put everything in a chronological order that makes more sense so forgive me if it's not perfect uh, centering this 455 kilohertz peak you know the filter there's a bandpass filter and it's situated over here on the schematic right between so you have your oscillator you have your which is your local oscillator you have your RF amplifier it comes into instead of a transistor they just use an integrated circuit for the mixer so this is your mixer and it comes out here as your 455 kilohertz IF it then goes through this little device which is supposed to be a 455 kilohertz band pass it's a wide band band pass filter and it's adjustable there's two adjustments one is to make it symmetrical so that it's the peak is nice and flat on the top and and the you know the the edges are the drop offs are even and then the other adjustment i believe is to center it over the 455 kilohertz unfortunately the adjustment for the centering does not work on this particular filter i think the filter has a problem uh, this is such a wide bandwidth on it for the for a filter that i believe it's not going to affect us but if it does i do have a modern uh, ceramic uh, filter bandpass filter that is probably better than the one that's in here that I could put in there and uh, it that'll take care of that if I have to but I'm not going to replace it unless it really needs it um, as far as everything else is concerned so far everything's kind of falling right into place so let me finish up the sensitivity alignment and a couple other things and we'll come back and give this thing a test and see how it works okay so here we are got it all put back together and uh, it turned out really well uh, I'm really happy with it and I'll tell you it takes some getting used to on the AM on this thing to understand how it works but once you figure it out you realize that this this AM tuner is something special now right now I'm at the bottom of a hill as I always say over and over again <laughs> in the basement and to make matters worse it's middle of the day today so the AM is not so good but I did tune in a station and I kind of want to demonstrate how some of these controls work and how they can be used to make the uh, the a of course with AM this tuner actually does really well with music because the high frequencies are amazing on it I've never really heard a tuner that can reproduce the high frequencies like this one but the nice thing is if you're looking for distance DX and you want to hear voice okay so talk radio or whatever what what you usually see on AM uh, there are some tools that this thing has that will help you to clear up some otherwise you know static -y stations so I'm going to demonstrate that I'm going to first of all switch you over to the uh, front microphone on the camera which is not so good but it will do a much better job picking up the speakers because my uh, the one I speak through normally is very directional to cut out all the background noise so let's get switched over to that and we'll do a little demo all right we're switched over to the front microphones and you will hear the air conditioning and things going in the background but at least you should be able to hear the radio now now what we're going to do is we're going to just turn on the radio as is I'm tuned into a station that's uh, relatively strong in the area and we're just I have all of the I'm on wide IF band and I'm not using the beat canceller so let's just turn it on and listen the student loans and you can hear how high pitched that mortgage but that's when and you do hear some static to savings and investments so so now we're going to switch to narrow band and see how that affects it to cover expenses in the years that he doesn't get the bonus but man that is still a and you can see essentially by going to narrow band it's going to crop off the high frequencies but a lot less static to erase what were i mean they were just outrageous rates that he was paying on credit so now what if we want the high frequencies but still want to cancel some of the noise this is where this beat canceler and this is really cool how this works 
And that helped him avoid any, you know, taking any loans from the 401k. So we can use the upper or lower sideband of the center frequency. This information into any 401k allocation decision without that, that Joe and his wife were going to make. And with this information and a better sense of, of Joe's risk tolerance. So I asked Joe to rank the risk tolerance on a one to ten scale, one conservative, ten aggressive, and I asked Joe about. So what I just demonstrated is when you use the beat canceler feature on this, you actually have a choice of the upper or lower sideband. That's what this is. And it uses those sidebands to kind of shift the channel a little bit away from where the noise is. So if the noise is above your channel or if it is below your channel, you can switch to lean towards the upper or lower sideband of this AM broadcast. Now, uh, I'm going to do some demo of, of kind of, or at least an explanation of what this do, what this means um, in the video. So hopefully I either just did that or, <laughs> again, this whole thing's being shot out of sequence. So we'll try to put things together in a way that they're more understandable. So, uh, you could see how this all works together and again now you've got a great plan for him he, he is on his way so andy for everyone else listening they've got retirement savings in their 401k maybe juggling debt payments and they may have that little twinge of embarrassment that boy i'm in this situation at my age what do i do what help do you have for them investingsense.com set time to meet with them now let me switch back over to the other microphone for a second Okay, we're now back to our normal microphone. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, is, just before we finish up here, is on the FM, if you remember on part one of the video, we talked about how the wide and narrow band, IF band, really didn't have a whole lot of influence. Well, the reason is, is because this tuner is so amazing, number one. Number two is that as there was in the old days, we don't have as many channels, adjacent channels. You know, back in the 1970s, the dial was just packed with, with stations. And those stations would get right on top of one another. And you can really see the difference between the wide and narrow band in that. We don't really have that in this area, especially where I live. So you can't really see much difference. The other thing is... When this thing is in narrow band, the sound quality is still unbelievable. And you really don't take a big hit on sound quality like you do on some of the other tuners out there that have wide and narrow IF band. So that took me a while to figure that out because I'm used to <laughs> hearing a little bit of a hit on your sound quality. Uh, it's just a testament to how this thing works. So once again... Um, I'm not really going to be able to demonstrate the IF band because of those two facts that don't have a lot of adjacent channels that we can compare. And really, if, if you don't have any adjacent channels, this tuner will still do a really good job of the uh, high frequencies. Now, the other thing is a lot of FM stations today do not broadcast at the fidelity that they used to. Um, there used to be some relatively high fidelity FM st stereo stations out there. Today, there's not a whole lot of them out there. And of the ones that are out there, they're long distance. So you're never going to get that performance again where you would see the difference. So uh, this is a great receiver. And I can see why it has such a reputation. Um, it was very interesting to, to do the alignment on it. And it was uh, even more interesting to demonstrate and to find out how it works. So uh, I hope you all enjoyed this two-part series here on this tuner. Uh, not a whole lot of these out there. Uh, so <laughs> I'm pretty happy that I got to actually work on one. So again, I thank you all for your time. And uh, we have a just ton of projects going on plus I have uh, a lot going on at work so the videos again are not going to be coming real often as they normally do 
Uh, I thank you all once again. Thank you all for uh, the donations you made, for the kind words and comments and everything. And I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And all the best. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.